Nakayama-san, um, the Japan is has always been a crucial player uh, in this area. But is there concern that in Japan now that the country is being marginalized to some degree? That we have uh, South Korea and North Korea driving the relationship to some degree. We had uh, President Xi Jinping recently with his uh, summit, and obviously they're playing a, a key role uh, with the North. Uh, now President Trump uh, presumably about to meet Kim Jong-un. Is there concern that Japan's interests might be put to the wayside, that, for example, a deal might um, require North Korea to give up ICBMs, but not uh, medium-range missiles that could target Tokyo, or, um, or not raise the issue of, of the uh, kidnapped Japanese. Is there, is there anxiety that Japan is being left out of the picture? Mm. Uh, at the first beginning, uh, before I make a comment, I'd like to say uh, thank you very much who gathered uh, here especially the uh, uniform that you are wearing, the armed forces of the United States. Uh, 73 years ago, we are not allies. We fought against each other, our ancestors. But now we made a reconciliation. And uh, we fought, we fight against the uh, uh, lots of evil uh, of the world. And uh, I'm really proud U.S. military and our uh, Japanese self-defense forces are strong allies, uh, whole nation. So on behalf of Japanese people, I really would like to say thank you very much to the, the soldiers who gathered here. And uh, one thing I'd like to tell you, I learned English by myself from Hollywood movies called Beverly Hills Cop 1. <laughs> so my English skill is not so good. I, I might say so-so, so please be patient to listen my English, okay? So um, uh, think 73 years ago. I am a Japanese. I don't want to say this, but uh, maybe during those periods, every people who lived uh, other countries look my country at that time now compared to North Korea. Maybe North Korea in 20th century is Japan. Maybe. But uh, now we are allies. Means we have to learn from the history. So North Korea, if, I mean the, the Korea Peninsula and this East Asia region is the only one place Cold War still exists. And I live in Osaka. So if Kim Jong-un pushed the button of the missile, it only eight minutes to shoot my family in Osaka. And we feel threat, we know the risk, and, to, and how to hit the risk of the war is the title of this meeting. And uh, one thing, uh, if I write a kanji character, Kim, do you know what does it mean, Kim? It's gold. President Trump loves gold. <laughs> so gold goes fit, I guess. But uh, this is not so easy. Um, remember, uh, 1945, February 4th, what happened at that time? In Crimea, in Yalta conference, Churchill, Roosevelt, Stalin together and did make, make a discussion and decision. Why don't we take Korea Peninsula from 38 degree line up to north to the Soviet Union? Stalin, bring it. <coughs> OK, so your souvenir. OK, 38 degree line to the south, to, to the UN, which means United States. And still, Korea Peninsula, same shape, same content, no change. But this time, it may be a change if we strong will together focusing on the Korea Peninsula. But uh, we have uh, uh, three concerns, as you know. One is uh, adoptees by North Korea. We never forget about uh, Mr. Wambia from Ohio. 
he, I think he killed by North Korea. Even he came back safely. Uh, after a few days, if he came back from North Korea, he passed away. And uh, so we have uh, 17 uh, victims captured by North Korea. And the second is a missile. Third is a nuclear. So of course, we are going to talk with South Korea, China, but uh, Korea Peninsula, for me, it looks like a scale, Libra. So when you put the weight on the scale plate, scale 50-50 equal fitting. So 50-50 is a balanced. But so if you put the weight, uh, United States, maybe here China, Russia, North Korea, South Korea, and Japan will be well balanced. But if you move this weight to the other, together, maybe this balance will lose. So this is the Korea Peninsula, and this is six party talks. And this is how we, go, we are going to think about compared to 20th century of Yalta Conference, and now it's a 21st century version of Yalta Conference just begun. So how are we going to talk with all the six countries? Are you going to make a profit for this? Or be a gentleman? No eager, no, you know, uh, to get everything. But uh, one thing I'd like to ask the professor, the, that the, uh, two days ago, uh, Mr. Putin and uh, Moon Jae-in called each other officially. And uh, Putin said to the Moon Jae-in that uh, Russia also would like to into the meet, you know, the talks. So I thought Russia already sell, sold, it, sold, the, sold their license to Chinese Beijing, but it wasn't. So still, we, you know, we have to uh, wear the glass of the 20th century. What is a democracy? What is a liberty, liberal? What is a communist? What is a CCCP, USSR, this vision has to be needed if you look at the, uh, our region. My English is correct? Okay. Oh, it's excellent. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. <laughs> um, and I mean, North Korea sees a role for Japan in this, and I'm wondering whether Japan is prepared to play that. I mean, North Korea, I think, uh, clearly remembers that Japan paid large sums to South Korea in the 1960s, and I think it's salivating over the prospect of a similar amount of money coming to the North uh, to settle old issues um, as part of this kind of a peace process that they believe they've introduced. Is that something that Japan might be prepared to do in the coming years? We will talk with the United States, Donald Trump, the president. We will follow his footsteps. We will watch and see how it goes. Uh, when we, this is actually, this year is a 40th anniversary, uh, uh, how do you say, re, uh, reunion uh, between the Chinese uh, official diplomat. Right. Diplomatic policy. D establishment of diplomatic relations. Yes. It's a 40th anniversary. So why Chinese a uh, little bit uh, calm down against uh, Japan, except PLA activities expanding the South China Sea or the western part of Pacific Ocean, or submarine activities. But um, in this sense, uh, how do you say? Uh, but uh, I, 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 yes, of course, we are preparing uh, lots of uh, happenings after this. But uh, we have to, uh, OK, so, so when the Chinese, uh, when we, the, between the China, Japan diplomatic relations uh, again started, and we cut it the Taiwan relations, uh, that was before the United States shake hands with China. 
at that time. Right. But this time, US go forward compared to our movement. So this time, we will watch the US government well. And, uh, but uh, we focusing on the same purpose. So, and uh, now, uh, compared to the uh, dip diplomatic re relations between other countries, uh, the president, between the president Donald Trump and uh, our Prime Minister Abe's meeting, Macron and Trump, Merkel and Trump, who played the golf at the Amalau? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> yeah, this is not, uh, you know, the, it seems to me it's not, uh, our Prime Minister better make sense. Uh. So uh, let's call a lot, let's shake hands a lot, let's hug a lot, let's play golf a lot. And uh, we play the role to, to, to protect the freedom of Korea Peninsula and no more nuclear facility for just, not just North, but the South also. Whole the Korea Peninsula have to be zero nuclear weapons and mid-range missiles. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I vote for you. <laughs> um, Governor Richardson, since I mean you're somebody who has actually negotiated with the North Koreans, the North Korean officials I've spoken with speak very uh, highly of your ability to uh, see the picture and to negotiate with them. Um, what if you were planning? Uh, the, the meeting between President Trump and Kim Jong-un, what would you see as a successful summit and how would you organize it to try to maximize the, the return for the U.S.? Well, what I would start out by saying at the risk of taking credit from President Trump, who's already taken credit for everything, uh, l let me say that I would caution against this grandiose optimism that has sprung since some very good developments have taken place. I'm not going to diminish that. But here are my worries. I would say to the president, which will never happen, because uh, he won't listen <laughs> to me or anyone. One, I would say, Mr. President, um, first, I'm a little worried about the distance between the US and South Korea on some basic positions, on denuclearization, uh, on the step-by-step -step process the South Koreans want, uh, on denuclearization before there's any kind of trade benefits or sanctions lifted, uh, while our position is very clear. Uh, no uh, positive gives unless there is complete denuclearization. So bridge the gap also on the issue of the nuclear umbrella uh, because, you know, un under the treaty, we have ships, we have nuclear subs uh, in the region, uh, in Japan. Uh, Japan needs that umbrella. So bridge the U.S.-South Korea gap. Number two, I would say what is also important is there's a basic difference between what denuclearization means for us and the North Koreans. What? The North Koreans uh, see it as basically a freeze, a limitation on existing weapons. Uh, number three, and what do we see? We see complete dismantlement. There's a bridge that needs to be uh, fixed. Um, I would also say, don't forget the human rights issues. One, the three Americans detained. You know, Mickey and I and our foundation, we were involved in the Warmbier case, and, mm -hmm. you know, ended tragically. Uh, secondly, the remains of our soldiers. We've been talking and honoring our soldiers. Uh, I think you covered it, Nick, but in 08, I brought seven remains back from uh, the North Koreans. They wanted to resume the recovery program. That's important. Third, I think there are some South Korean, North Korean reunification family issues uh, that, that can be uh, improved upon at the summit. And then there are other issues that you know, just don't come up. One, stop exporting chemical weapons to Syria. Two, nuclear and missile exports. Uh, go for that, stopping those. Uh, and then see if you can set up 
a process, a process that may not, I think the president wanted, at one point I heard him say that he wanted denuclearization before the summit. <laughs> That's not gonna happen. I think, is denuclearization ever gonna happen? You know, I, I'm very skeptical, but you know, you never can say never. You never can say never. Down the road, you know, with proper framework of negotiations, uh, it's possible, but very remote. But I think, and my last point, is I think Kim Jong-un has something up his sleeve. <laughs> I don't know what it is. But, you know, why is he doing this? He's doing this because he wants to stay in power. And he knows we're the only ones that can knock him off, maybe with, you know, with other players. He, he wants to stay in power. He loves power. He's killed his family. He's killed relatives. He's, you know, changed the military. Secondly, he wants sanctions re, uh, lifted. He's not going to get that. But I think China here has played a positive role after years of not doing virtually anything. I, you got to give China a little credit. Nobody likes to do that. But you know, they squeezed, they had border enforcement, you know, those UN sanctions, coal, oil, uh, fish, uh, foodstuffs, uh, North Korean workers not bringing money back in. I think that had a bite. What else? Um, why is he doing this? I always remember the North Koreans saying, you and the United States and North Korea should settle this. You know, China shouldn't be part of this. South Korea shouldn't be, Japan, we're the big guys in the region. This is what they'd say to me countless times. Let's work something out. My last, I keep saying my last point, <laughs> is this. You know, in a negotiation with the North Koreans, how do you negotiate with them? Well, the first thing I can tell you, they don't think like we do. They think they're always right. Everything comes from the deity, from Kim Il-sung, Kim Jong-il, uh, the new leader now. Um, so they're never wrong. They don't believe in quid pro quos. They believe in, all right, well, uh, after a certain period of time, we'll give you more time to come to our position. That's, that's their idea of, but when you look at details, you look at frameworks, you look at, you got to really delve into what exactly they're signing on to because they're going to bob and weave. And then in a negotiation, Nick, you know, there's going to be this setting of the president sits here, his team sits here, the North Koreans sit across each other. The North Koreans are going to vent. They're going to go very harsh. The way you make a deal with the North Koreans is on the sidelines, in a meal. You walk. You know, that's how I made some of the on the prisoners, on the American pilots, on, on remains. You do it informally at a dinner, walk it. So I hope the president has patience to like, you know, just stay and informally try to engage Kim Jong-un. The only reason I think there's a possibility of a denuclearization is maybe if you look at Kim Jong-un's uh, January 1st speech, he said very clearly, I, you know, I don't need to keep testing a nuclear facility. He said it January 1st. Mickey showed it to me. Um, I don't need to test anymore. Uh, I've got my military capability. I want to improve my economy. So I think if, if he is ready to do that and is ready to trade his weapons, although I'm, I'm going to say again, I'm very skeptical that that is the end game that what he's going to want in return. You know, talk about a Marshall Plan in World War II. It's going to be a very big Marshall Plan that includes uh, every country uh, right here in this panel. So, I don't know, I just rambled on. I, I just think that we've got to be hopeful, but enormously skeptical. Uh, we've got to, I just hope the president is prepared, and I'm not sure he will be. I think we got to think this very carefully. We got to talk to the Japanese. I mean, they got some, you know, real domestic and foreign policy. They've been a friend with the South Koreans. You know, things are very. They each are nominating each other for Nobel prizes, but you know, there there's a little gap in our positions. The U.S. and South Korea. So we got a lot of things to straighten out in a month. So let me 
push you on that a little bit. So I, I very much share your um, hopeful skepticism. I would be extremely surprised if uh, denuclearization actually happens in any kind of timetable in the next few years. And I've just seen this show too many times for too many years. Um, I also think that South Korea already seems to be promising a Marshall Plan. And if you look at the Panmunjom Declaration, then it's all about providing infrastructure. It's all about providing uh, economic development in a way that seems to recall the kind of policies that Kim Dae-jung pursued. Doesn't that reduce our uh, leverage? Doesn't that reduce President Trump's leverage uh, if, he, if, if Kim Jong-un thinks that he's already going to get that from the South, if the South and the North are already kind of embarked on this um, journey of peace? But, but also, even if, even if we're right to be skeptical about denuclearization, even if North Korea is going to blow up a few things but not really end its program, not allow uh, intrusive inspections, then isn't that still maybe a good thing? And that it does deal with some of the other issues you mentioned, like transfer of materials to Syria, uh, perhaps human rights in some dimension, economic development, a process that begins to reduce the risk of war and perhaps begins to tame North Korea. So can well, one be both skeptical and, and optimistic about other kinds of changes? Yeah, you know, I remember the father, uh, Kim, Kim Jong-il. He was a rug merchant, a deal maker. Okay, uh, we'll give you this prisoner, but you send President Clinton, or you send uh, Clapper, or you send Jimmy Carter, but if it's really low level, send Richardson, or whatever, uh, and you get something in return. Kim Jong-un is, I, I think he's got a broader vision, and you know, I'm... I'm just saying, for years, we've underestimated him. We thought, uh, you know, this is a guy that's going to blow up the world. He doesn't know what he's doing. I think he's basically a rational actor, unpredictable, uh, enormously vindictive, dangerous. But I think what, what I'm saying, Nick, is, is yes, yes, I think that leverage is reduced. I, I just saw the package of the South Koreans, that what they wanted, the step-by-step. -step. Yeah. I mean, it's way different than what we're saying, which is, you've got to denuclearize, and then maybe we take off sanctions. And they're saying, no, no step by step, you know, you do this, you're going to get uh, a train. I saw that there's a train, an infrastructure. You, you're going to get trade benefits. We're going to, you know, have joint, uh, joint enterprise zones. Um, so I, I, I guess what I'm, what I'm concluding is that Another point, because Kim Jong-un is in charge, I think that is, and he, there is no Kim gae Won who was their nuclear negotiator. He's doing it all. This is why the prospect of denuclearization, I think we've got to really think it through as it might happen. And, and, and let's have... Uh, you know, let's come back, not with what Kim Jong-un wants, which is, I bet you we can get more of the freeze here on the weapons, a, a freeze, a, a curbing of the use. Uh, you know, let's have a, a staged negotiation. I don't think 2020 is a realistic goal, which is what the administration has said, or maybe a little longer. But, but and, and then the most important point that that hasn't happened is, Inspections. We got to inspect. We didn't inspect in the agreed framework. You know, young beyond a little bit. And what did they do? They did. They enrich uranium. They have made a secret deal with Pakistan. We've got to have international inspectors. Hopefully, U.S. inspectors from Los Alamos, Sandia, our nuclear labs. Uh, there's got to be real oversight, or it's 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 worthless. And you know, Kim Jong Un has said, well. In May, I'm going to invite experts to see this facility that's already been demolished. That's not going to be enough. John, um, our leverage as we move toward the meeting with uh, President Trump and Kim Jong-un uh, arises in large part, or is perceived to arrive in large part from sanctions, economic sanctions, partly imposed by China. Um, you've done a lot of research on those sanctions and effectiveness. Um, so how, 
much leverage will we indeed be having in the, in the coming weeks, and in particular in light of the recent reports that China is already actually relaxing those sanctions? Sure. You know, on the sanctions piece, uh, it, it presents a very interesting puzzle in the sense that after every single round of North Korean advancements on their nuclear ballistic missile testing, there was another round of sanctions. So in many respects, you see almost this phenomenon of sanctions as antibiotics. As you apply it on the North Korean regime more and more, uh, there is this inconvenient fact that they have been able to procure the items that they need for the next stage of advancement. But in practice, what we're seeing is the North Korean regime, and frankly, we don't analyze North Korea as a country, but as a 1%, 99% phenomenon, the North Korean elite state trading companies and those businessmen doing the uh, type of procurement on behalf of what we call North Korea Incorporated, they've migrated to the Chinese marketplace and they've embedded in the Chinese marketplace. So when it comes to this kind of procurement, uh, there is this mechanism now where in the primary instance, applying sanctions does create a setback, but in the secondary and tertiary spaces, we're actually seeing adaptation and frankly, the normalcy of North Korean activities in the Chinese marketplace that raises this question about the efficacy of sanctions. Now, I, I don't argue that sanctions don't work. It's just how high and how high the bar is in terms of this type of impact. So when it comes to the thesis that maximum pressure and sanctions is what brought North Korea to the table, I certainly think that's a part of it, but I think we have to be cautious in giving too much credit uh, to the sanctions piece of it uh, in the sense that there is, again, this phenomenon that's already taken place. The, the last thing I'd mention about the sanctions piece is that when you ask this question, are they working or not, one uh, very specific objective metric is smuggling. We're seeing smuggling when it comes to oil going into North Korea and sometimes reportedly through Russian companies uh, and then the transshipment of North Korean coal to markets abroad uh, through uh, different conduits. So there is this coping mechanism aspect of it, but uh, I think the sanctions piece is the element that has created a certain type of diplomatic room, uh, particularly for the South Korean game plan to unfold. A lot of the activity that we're seeing right now uh, there is a very specific South Korean role in terms of creating uh, a venue, a, a table for negotiations. And, and frankly, I think that's the side of things that we're probably going to see more momentum going forward as well. Um, Gene, the, um, what, I mean, a, a lot of the things that are discussed are, in a sense, um, sort of holding Pattern. So we, maybe we try to deter North Korea for a while, or maybe we do a freeze for a freeze for a while. Uh, but the implicit assumption that people are reluctant to articulate is that we do this for a while until the North Korean regime changes or is no longer around. I think that was one of the undercurrents in the agreed framework back in 1994. Um, is, so you've lived in Pyongyang. How? How stable is the regime? Is the, would you bet that the regime is going to be around in another 10 years? Uh, well, I'm not going to make the mistake of so many of the analysts who've come before me who've predicted, given a number <laughs> to, when this regime is going to collapse. I think one thing that we should, one of the challenges for us is that we have so little access. So that means we have very little understanding of how that society operates, how they think. But one thing I can tell you is that we need to look at it through a Korean filter, first of all. Korean people are, uh, as the panel know, they very proud. They have a sense of identity and national pride that has, is a part of their, and John and I were talking about this, part of their heritage that has been built over thousands of years. They call themselves a shrimp, shrimp among whales. There's a, fro a proverb that says, if the whales play, it's the shrimp that gets hurt. And so Koreans have always recognized that they are sandwiched between these major superpowers, um, and that if they don't protect themselves, that they are going to be exterminated. So they have a fierce sense of national pride. That's true of the South Koreans. If you know any South Koreans, you know how stubborn and proud they are. It's true of the North Koreans as well. So they have a singular sense of identity. Also, I should point out that the regime has used the war, the Korean War, and the animosity and the, the conflict with the United States to build a sense of I don't know what it, how you call it, but they, they have maintained this sense that they are still in a state of war. They've maintained this sense that they are still actively fighting off outside aggression. And there is nothing like the threat from an outside force to bring people together. And so the regime has used that propaganda 
to bring, give a sen the people a sense of unity. So I would just say that I don't expect to see an Arab Spring, for example. This is a, a people who have a very homogenous background, have a certain history. So look at it through that Korean filter, the history, the filter of Korean history and its place in this region. That said, I think we just don't know because we don't know exactly what's happening. Even if I'm there on the ground, I don't quite know what's happening uh, internally that is so opaque to us. But don't you think that, I mean, I'm just struck more in talking to defectors that uh, in kind of until the famine period, that it seemed that most people, that brainwashing basically worked. That people got the government propaganda, they basically absorbed it and believed in it. And that in recent years, partly because of the famine, partly because there's been so much interaction with China, so many Koreans going into China, so many rumors that China is so much better off, uh, so many uh, thumb drives coming in, so many DVDs coming in, that especially in border areas, and especially maybe in those who were more affluent, that it's not the same North Korea as, as 25 years ago, and that there may be some kinds of rumblings about discontent toward the regime, and I agree, nothing like an Arab Spring, but do you think we're right to, that there is, that it, there is a real difference in character today versus the past? I think it's important to remember that I always think of North Korea as a kind of monarchy, like a modern day monarchy. And with a monarchy, you need to keep that court economy intact. You need to keep the elites happy. And so these elites are actually very important in North Korea. Every time I flew in and out of Pyongyang, I flew on an air choreo plane that was filled with North Koreans, students, businessmen, bureaucrats, athletes. These are people who were going in and out of the country, going through Beijing, and seeing what the outside world was like. Frankly, I would sit next to these North Koreans who, like me, would have to turn their cell phones in. So they had Samsung phones, iPhones, so they knew what life was like. They were as addicted as we are to their smartphones when they were outside North Korea. Now, Kim Jong-un knows he has to keep them happy as well, because they are the ones who are propping him up and, keep, and, and really keeping him in power. So even though we tend to think of them as just the elite, they play a very important role in keeping that system, the political system, intact. We have seen a couple signs and examples in the last few years of people, very high level people from that class defect. And this is a difference than in previous years. So we had the deputy ambassador from the North Korean embassy in London who defected a few years ago. Uh, and he's probably one of the more high profile defectors. Uh, and, and these are people who we hadn't seen defect so frequently in the past. So that perhaps is a sign that there's some discontent among that very important class. Nick? Yeah. Nick, if I, if I could, I mean, your basic question is, is there going to be a change in government, say, in 10 years? And, you know, as a politician, I'll, you, you, first thing you say is never say never. I think, nonetheless, and I don't think there's that, there is a remote situation. I remember the last trip I made to North Korea was with Eric Schmidt of Google. And Eric's objective and our objective, Gene was on that trip, mm -hmm. was to bring the internet to North Korea. We didn't think we had a very good chance. <laughs> but I can tell you that you know, we, when we went into schools, we went in to talk to the government leaders, business leaders, there was, there was quite a bit of interest. The government didn't allow it, right? I, I think you never say never why, because what springs revolutions? One, lacks of, lack of freedom, and two, the economy. You know, the economy in North Korea is not in good shape. Now, Kim Jong-un says he's going to transform it, private sector, and he, I think he is different than his father. His father was, you know, he wanted aid, food, nuclear reactors. I think this guy wants more private sector activity from what I've learned with uh, interactions with the South Koreans, that he wants, you know, McDonald's there, that he wants uh, more of a private sector enterprise. Um, that, that's in his favor in staying in office. But you never, um, I, I, and I hear what you said, they, they hear about what's happening in China, they hear about what's happening in South Korea. I mean, they're not totally under an umbrella where they don't know what's going on. They, they, they hear, and it's through families, and probably Gene's the best one to, 
to assess this. Um, so I think there's also a challenge for Kim Jong-un, those that say, oh, you know, the cult of personality is gonna stay there forever. I think the odds are that he, 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 he has traction for a period of time, but you know, I guess I'll conclude again, you never say never. Mm -hmm. And you may not have brought uh, quite the internet to Pyongyang, but I tweeted with this phone uh, from North Korea using the SIM cards that, I mean, if you are a foreigner and you hand over your passport and you pay a fortune, you can get a SIM card that actually does access the internet. Uh, and and, and, and Nick, phone. you know this very well. I read your column on Sunday, and you said that one of the reasons you went to Japan uh, to be the correspondent for the New York Times, you thought that North Korea was going to fall, right? In the 1990s. <laughs> and, and that's when I met you, when I yep. brought one of the that's right. prisoners back. So yeah. Yeah. We've, been, we've been waiting a long time. <laughs> Nakayama-san, um, so um, Governor Richardson earlier talked about human rights as a factor in the negotiations. And so to what extent should President Trump bring up these issues of human rights, either in the sense of the kidnapped Japanese? And, you know, on the one hand, my heart just goes out to those families who kids were kidnapped on the beach, Megumi-san. Uh, but it's been 40 years since she was kidnapped. We don't know if she's still alive. Uh, should a small number of those detainees be an obstacle to try to resolve an enormous geopolitical crisis. And likewise, you know, human rights within North Korea. Uh, the labor camps, I think there is a general sense that the conditions are about as bad as they can get. But is this the moment to raise those concerns? Uh, <clears throat> please don't say uh, Megumi Yokota is not alive or not. We believe that she will alive. And never say never. So uh, I think, I hope, uh, even, you know, the Moon, Moon, President Moon Jae-in called our prime minister. He talked with Kim Jong-un about this issue, the human rights issue, abduction issues. And uh, the President Trump, also he will uh, say directly to uh, Kim Jong-un, this is a uh, uh, really thank to those presidents. But I hope one day uh, our Prime Minister Abe directly negotiate uh, bilaterally between the Kim Jong-un. I think it happened after uh, US and uh, North Korea bilateral meeting. And uh, I think uh, the Mr. Kim Jong-un afraid about uh, he, will, he will be a possi possibly he will be a, become like a Qaddafi of Libya. But uh, on the other hand, what, then what is his model, image? I think his model is he wants to become like a pillar, pillar of the uh, balance scale. And uh, so one, hand, one plate in China, one plate in US. I don't know, Russia, maybe he, this plate. And uh, he wants to, not like Hong Kong, controlled by Chinese government, no freedom for him. I think his model is Japanese emperor system. After World War II, the end, occupation army, general headquarters came to my country and they made a 3S, 5D, you know, the order, uh, order to the Japanese. And uh, before, during the war, we, our ancestors thought our emperor is a god, as a god. But General MacArthur knew it. So he take photo with our emperor at that time. And uh, he is not a god. He is an emperor. But GHQ, the, the occupation army, never uh, killed our emperor. And uh, so Kim Jong-un and Japan now became a very big country as an economy, a very investable, unique country now in East Asia. And Kim Jong-un. Uh, want to chase with South Korea using Japanese model after the war. So Mr. Kim would like to become a symbol of the North Korea. This is what he is writing for the future story for himself. 
And one quick question. There's been a lot of, uh, there's been some reports uh, from South Korea that Kim Jong-un had transmitted through Moon Jae-in an invitation to Prime Minister Abe to meet with Kim Jong-un. Can, can you say if that is correct? Um, we have to be careful still. Um, he sent a letter, it's okay. He smiled, it's okay. He is wearing Giorgio Armani, it's okay. But <laughs> action, we need move. We, we don't need move, but uh, we need movement from the older world together. But also he, Mr. Kim Jong, have to do something. Erase nuclear, clean up, and no more, uh, how do you say, laboratories for the biochemical weapons or, uh, you know, like uh, moving of the uh, ninja activities for all the world. Please be gentle. So no Abe Kim summit for the time being, but down the road, who knows? Uh, I don't know, the professor knows it, but uh, he said, he made a comment about uh, this issue. Uh, the vision is a really long road that was a uh, long and winding road. Yeah. That's what the Harvard professor said. I believe so. Yeah. I want to become a student of his class. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're almost out of time, but I'd like to just go through my panelists and uh, ask them for to push them for percentage chances if they're willing to do that on various outcomes that we're all kind of wondering about in the case of North Korea. Um, so, you know, what percent chance that there will indeed be full de denuclearization? I'd, I'd like to use as a time frame uh, 2021, this the Milken Conference in 2021, uh, after the end of, the, of this presidential uh, term. So, uh, for starters, what percent chance, Milken Conference, 2021, North Korea has fully handed over all of its nuclear warheads in some verifiable way, has, has fully ended its uh, nuclear program? I would, um, I'll go first, I'll say uh, 5%. Jean? So if we're wrong, we're not gonna be invited back. No, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, I would probably say even lower than that. <laughs> okay. Nakayama-san, can we venture a a prediction from you? Uh, we are now focusing on North Korea. Yes. 100%. But I personally, uh, we, have, we don't have to forget about the Taiwan. I think 2020, where we, when we are going to have an Olympic and Paralympics game, I think the Taiwan stripe will be a little bit, uh, how do you say, messy or very tensioned. So might be small conflict between mainland China and Taiwan. And, and uh, you folk too much focusing on Korea Peninsula. Maybe uh, watch, watch this area. Too. It's good to remind us of that as yep. well. Uh, John, per percent chance of full denuclearization uh, by this time in 2021? I think it all depends. What I laid out, uh, the terrain being different, it's not an easy cop-out, but really there's so much at play right now. And it's happening behind closed doors at the top level. So the State Department in the United States, the Foreign Ministry in South Korea, the Foreign Ministry in North Korea, they've all been completely cut out. And so from that, if this gamble, and South Korea has been assuming a tremendous amount and using a lot of their political capital, if that risk pays off, then this idea of what they agreed to being acceptable, and that's the, the operative word because it's a political decision at the end of the day. If you know, handing over the fissile material, the ICBMs, but then retaining a small number of nuclear warheads, whatever they decide is the definition of uh, this process of progress in denuclearization, that's all political. And so for me, uh, I, I think we have to see what more of these revelations are, are coming out. But uh, again, I have to think we have to look at some of these old maps in terms of how we understand the Korean Peninsula. Bill? 20%. 20%. .20%. But there's got to be proper inspections. I'm not sure that's going to happen. But I'll, I'll go out on a limb, 20%. OK. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm afraid we are uh, out of time. We're turning into pumpkins. Um, but I would like to thank you all for joining us. And I'd especially like you to join me in thanking our panel and wrestling with these problems today. <laughs>